the Preakness, so I'll be very happy if I can win it. And it's still a million dollar race, and I like money, so what else can I say? Which brings me to your original question, Kenny, about the odds. I think what you have here is a New York Maryland battle between funny side supporters and the Edgar Prado fans out there who know him from his days here in Maryland. I think Peace Rules will wind up the favorite. And with everybody talking about taking back in this race, Peace Rules may indeed find himself on an uncontested lead. What do you guys think about that? We're going to hold our comments until we hear from the jockey because uh, we just had him after winning with Best Minister in the Sir Barton taking a maiden and jumping up in a stakes race and all the acclaim for that. And we failed to talk about the actual running of the Preakness. Good thing for us, we got Janine Edwards. She spoke with him a little bit ago. Edgar was the nation's leading rider three years in a row, and he has a record 14 Pimlico riding titles, but you're based in New York now. How much fun is it to come back here to Maryland and ride, especially on Preakness Day? You, I'm sure have a lot of fond memories here. Absolutely. It's always nice to come back to the place that really helped you out and launch your career. I have a great memories here, and uh, it will be super if I win this race because uh, I have a lot of friends, a lot of fans here, and um, it all will be for them and the people that helped me out first. Now, going to New York, uh, you were able to make some new connections with trainers, and one of them being Bobby Frankel, who put you on peace rules for the Kentucky Derby, who many people say he ran one of the gutsiest races they've seen in a long time. Is he gutsy, or is he talented, or both? And here he is. Here you guys are turning for home in the Derby. Absolutely. He's a very talented and gutsy horse. I mean, he had the courage. Uh, my guy, he, I thought he's going to finish third, about three or four lanes behind the the two horses in front, but he fought real hard and tried to come back on it. Um, he showed before that he can put any horse away. He's a little bitty guy, but boy, is he determined, doesn't he? Yes, he does try real hard. <laughs> he tries, he may handle it 50% every time, and I hope he did the same thing today. I hope so, too. Now, you've ridden in six Preaknesses. Where does Peace Rules rate as far as your mounts? Well, I think he's, he's the, today's the best chance I have to win this race. And uh, hopefully he takes the track very well, and uh, hopefully he um, uh, and do a good show for the rest of the people come here. What's your assessment of Funny Side, the Derby winner? Oh, uh, uh, the thing is I beat it once already in, in, in Louisiana. Uh, hopefully I'll be able to turn the tables uh, today again, uh, and we beat him in the, in the Derby. Well, nobody knows this racetrack better than you. You've got an outside post. Mm -hmm. What are your thoughts going into the race, and uh, what have you heard out there from the other guys about how the track is playing today? Well, I rode the early races. The track looked pretty good, pretty safe, and um, I think that you have the right horse. You can do anything you want with it. You can place anywhere and um, uh, see what happens in the stretch. And so far, it looks like it's a um, pretty tough horse to beat Funny Side because he's a one fighter, too. Okay, well, we'll wish you good luck. I know everybody here in Maryland misses Edgar Prado, but he certainly is making a name for himself nationwide as well. Well, that was Hank playing the horns behind that interview. He's talented. He talked about Prada did 150%. That's even more than the standard 110%, which is also unbelievable. I don't know. Hank's question was, could he get a, an easy lead or, or a clear lead? I'm not sure, because I think Cherokee's boy, the outsider from the rail, might be gunning it for starters, too. This is a very complicated race tactically. A lot depends on exactly how the trainers and the jockeys choose to utilize their horses, because horses like Cherokee's boy, horses like Scrimshaw, New York Hero, all have the speed to go to the lead with Peace Rules, and maybe, conceivably, even beat him to the lead. I'm not sure Cherokee's boy has that much speed, but he, my point is, it's tactical, mm -hmm. and a lot is going to depend on that. Peace Rules is starting two spots inside of Funny Side. The question is, can he can he drift him out a bit, give him that? But he doesn't want to drift out too far because pretty soon he starts worrying about where he's running on the track. He can't keep concerning himself with another. It, to me, the Preakness is always more fun to handicap than the Kentucky Derby. The Kentucky Derby is impossible. For the Preakness, you get a chance to go back and look at the Derby and learn from it. In this particular case, it's pretty clear that if both horses get good trips like they did in the Derby, all right, Funny Side is a better horse than Peace Rules. But how will the post positions affect that? I mean, like you say, Funny Side is on the outside. You can see the trip that Funny Side had in the Derby. He's down along the inside saving ground. And that, uh, to a certain extent, uh, helped facilitate his victory. But what happens in the Preakness if he's four wide around the first turn? 
And what happens if while he's racing four wide, Peace Rules gets a, a, another good trip? And that means that Peace Rules probably is going to turn the tables it, on it him. It seemed that the funny side was unfairly criticized for getting a good trip. Good horses, good jockeys get good trips. They, like Michael Jordan gets good shots. Are used to anyway. Horses like funny side that have tactical speed, that can go to the lead or they can stalk the pace, typically get work out for themselves, better trips than other horses do. But in Funny Side's position today, he's got two or three of those other horses that have tactical speed inside of him in the starting gate. When you hit that first turn, and you're going around the first turn in the Prignus, you're going to know a lot about Funny Side's chances. If he's caught wide, he's in trouble. If he manages to tuck in and save some ground, then he's got a much better chance. No such problems in the Kentucky Derby. We're going to come back with still more analysis on the Preakness. we got more live racing coming up here from Pimlico. We're carrying forward from Baltimore. Stay around. is brought to you by Sitco. We know you. By Visa, proud sponsor of the Visa Triple Crown. By Long John Silvers, dive into something new. By Budweiser, the best things in life are the things that are true. Budweiser. By Diamond Cut Jeans, try a pair. They just fit better. And by Kawasaki All-Terrain and Utility Vehicles. Kawasaki, let the good times roll. The people are cold, but they're happy here at Pimlico. We're two hours, 12 minutes away from the 120th running the Preakness. If you don't want to gamble your own money, but still want to win money, ESPN is printing money and giving it away on the Sitco Pick 6 Challenge. A little late for today, but there's always next week. All right, yesterday here at Pimlico, they recreated that 1938 match race, War Admiral and Seabiscuit, and Seabiscuit won. And Seabiscuit will win in the movie also when it comes out in July, but it's not that easy to make these animals perform, as you'll see in the following. How fast? Your horse just broke the track record of Tamfran. There's a lot of huge challenges the minute you start to direct a movie like this. The real horse, Seabiscuit, comes along once in a century. He had a lot of different personality traits that we had to use a bunch of different Seabiscuits for. They have different degrees of training and specific things that they do in this film. The most challenging part of this movie is for the trainers to create a personality in Seabiscuits. We ended up using many different horses that were all Seabiscuits, picking and choosing the piece of behavior that we would need to create the sense of this animal. The care that Rusty has given these horses is just incredible. Man, does he look good. These horses have played an immeasurable role in our success. When I watch these racing scenes, I'm right back in the race again. That's what's making this film so great. And a reminder for an extra quarter, you can get a larger popcorn. Tim Smith is the NTRA commissioner. Did you get a role in that movie? Uh, no, I wasn't asked, actually. Unfortunately. All right, that's going to bring great attention to the sport, positive attention. You had some bad stuff going, though, after the pre after the derby into the Preakness. Well, and that's been straightened out, and, and uh, I think uh, attention now is back on the quest for the Triple Crown. I, I wanted to just commend the uh, unsung heroes in that, which are uh, Jose Santos and his fellow jocks. When they immediately stood up for him and said, this is ridiculous, Shane Sellers, Mike Smith, Pat Day, mm -hmm. Richard Migliori, uh, just as a fan, I, I knew there was nothing to it. Right, they carry certain reputations, and his was very good going in. Uh, very nice of you to come up on the roof with us, but who are the people you left behind in the fancy area? Well, in the, uh, in the fancy area, uh, one table has Bill Clinton and Bon Jovi. The, and, together? Yes, yes, sitting next to each are other. Are they betting like madmen? Uh, they are mostly uh, being interrupted by, <laughs> by people that right. uh, want to talk. And then the, the table next has two even bigger legends in some ways, uh, Brooks Robinson and Jim McKay. So it's uh, this is one of these great events that transcends sport. I mean, it's just a lot of buzz and excitement. Drawing some big timers to the sport. Thanks for stopping up. Thank Good you. luck with the race today. Thanks. Hammer, you have something down there. Bon Jovi or the president? <laughs> well, maybe someday she'll be president. They, she could get elected in Maryland if she wins the Preakness. Lisa Lewis, who trains Kiss and Saint. And uh, first of all, how's the horse doing, Lisa? Horse is doing very well. He's relaxed. He's over there sleeping and uh, getting ready, getting ready for his big day. What happened to him in the wood when uh, when he came out of the gate? Well, it was actually he broke well, and then uh, I think it was New York Hero that just came in over on a couple, like two horses, but he seemed to get the worst of it. And I think it just cost us our early position. We would have been closer early in the race. 
was his performance after that against the horses that ran one, two in the Derby? Is that what encouraged you to bring him here? Yeah, that definitely encouraged us that that race ended up such a key race. And the horse uh, of Jerkins that was behind us won the Withers and Senior Swinger obviously came out and won the turf stakes. So the race is uh, you know, a very good race. And then the other thing was that these last five weeks, the horse has trained terrific. He's really done well and uh, there he is <laughs> there, yep. he's awake there at least you've had a chance to look at the racetrack today it's obviously not like it was yesterday where speed and the rail were really dominating I'm sure you're happy to see that based on where you expect your horse to be yes they've done a great job because the track looks terrific I really didn't think it would look this good already so I, I think it's uh, playing very fair and and hopefully we'll have a good good chance ideally what kind of trip would you like to see him get where do you want him to be I want a really fast pace <laughs> I hope they roll in front of us and if we could be about six lengths off of them you know and we should be in good shape okay Lisa thanks for joining thank us. you all right Kenny all right, Hammer, thanks for that. Stay around. We're carrying on here from Pimlico. A couple hours away from the Preakness. Got another live race for you before that here on ESPN. If we don't get the president, we'll analyze Funny Side right after this. This presentation of the National Thoroughbred Racing Association continues on ESPN. Welcome back to Pimlico. Never forget that Wire to Wire is available to television viewers. That's going to be a full Preakness Stakes recap. That's coming Tuesday, 2 o'clock Eastern. Randy will probably be on that, won't you? Probably. All right. There's a, a way to get lost when you bring in too much information, you know, dosage, center of distribution, whatever that is. And I think that happened with Funny Side. First, the gelding situation. We'll get to that later. But also breeding, and, and, and you see it in front of you. It's supposed to be one way, and it turns out another. Well, Funny Side Sire was a horse called uh, Distorted Humor, who was a very, very fast horse. In fact, he, he was a track record-setting sprinter. This was the 1998 Churchill Downs handicap on the Kentucky Derby undercard. He went seven furlongs and 121 flat in this race, which set the track record at that time at Churchill Downs. And if you're a speed figure guy, his buyer's speed figure was 117, which is absolutely sensational. He'd also run a 118 and a 116 in sprint races. But... He wasn't just a sprinter. This was the Fayette handicap at Keeneland a couple of years earlier. He was just a three-year-old. This was a mile and an eighth. That's him on the outside. On the inside is a horse called Is It In Good, trained by Bob Baffert, who was a quality older horse. And you can see he's not really giving up much in the run to the wire. And he got a 110 buyer speed figure there. Well, sometimes the problem is they do so well in the sprint, and they're labeled sprinters. For, so Cherokee Run's another good example of that. They, they run so well in a sprint, and they get labeled that, and people forget about those other longer races they run. Exactly. Uh, Distorted Humor had four races around two turns in his career. In all four races, he ran very, very well. Now, maybe not quite as good as he did sprinting, but he still ran well. And as his, his pedigree, he's by 49 or out of a Danzig mare. He's bred to be a distance horse. And so far, his offspring around two turn races, this is his first crop, but they're batting 24% in two-turn races, which is an outstanding record. We, we have more myths that were thrown out with, with the win by uh, Funny Side at the Kentucky Derby. But with the gelding, first time since, what, 1929? Since 1929. New York Brad bred. Anderson, New York bred. First win for each, the trainer and the jockey. Yeah. I Those mean, weren't necessarily myths that have been going on for a long time. But, I mean, first, I guess, were, were the case there. And then there's yet another myth we try to debunk here at the Preakness, and that is the, uh, the tight turns at Pimlico. Well, we're going to go to the satellite photography, which we showed you on the Kentucky Derby draw in case you missed it. This is Churchill Downs. This is taken from the spirit of Goodyear. <laughs> there's, Goodyear blimp. These photos are taken from the same height. Now, that's Churchill, right? One mile in circumference. Pimlico now superimposed right on top of Churchill Downs. We have analyzed it. We have measured it. There is absolutely no difference between Churchill Downs and Pimlico in terms of how sharp the turns are. And they're both banked at about three and a half, four percent on the turns. So that's not even a factor anymore. All right, Kurt Hoover, do you have any urban legends you want to talk about? Yeah, we got a couple of owners out here having a good time out in the infield right now on Derby Day. It's just a little ways away from the big race. Ford Willis and David Pescarello, the owners of Cherokee's Boy. David, you look calm and cool, but I got a feeling you might be starting to get a little nervous out here. Uh, they're starting to sink in right now. I think once we get to the saddling area, it'll kick up a little more, and definitely when they take the track, it's it's going to be something like I've never felt before. I got to ask, with the Maryland connection, it's got to be even a bigger deal. I mean, the Preakness is a big deal to everybody, but Maryland, it, it's everything. It, it's, it's a big deal to us. I've spent many years in the infield, many years uh, watching races from the other side, and it uh, sounds like the fans are behind us. Our odds have dropped a lot from what I hear. Uh, I don't know if that's good or bad, but uh, it, it definitely means a lot being from here and spending a lot of time at Pimlico. Ford, you guys having fun out in the infield. When are you going to head over and uh, get with Cherokee's boy? 
Uh, we're not going to go until he comes over, but uh, we're having a great time. Our families are here. It's just super. i got to ask you, how much are you going to bet? I'm not betting at all. <laughs> bet, bet on the purse. That's it. We couldn't make as much as we win, if, you know, money-wise from the purse, but uh, it's just about winning. Forget the money. We just want to win it and, you know, do it for Maryland. Well, these guys are the pride of Maryland. If their horse wins, it's going to be one big, long party out here in the infield for all the Terrapins. Kenny, back to you. All right, Kurt, you know, to be clear, that's not the real end. He's in the auxiliary infield, the fancy infield. The real one is a little wilder. We're going to have him diving. mud wrestling if he was out there. We'll have him diving in a mud bog before the day's yeah. over. Stay around. I'm going to show you a race. We're going to tell you about it before we show it. Coming right back from Pimlico. Welcome back to Pimlico. They're setting up for the Sitco Dixie. It's a grade two. I want to remind you that the Preakness for the 128th time will be run. It's going to be on NBC, 5 o'clock Eastern, in return for us mentioning NBC. NBC will one day mention when Jimmy Houston bass fishing will be shown on ESPN. Right now, Janine, get her back into the show. Tell us what's going on with the Sitco Dixie. Well, the horses for the Sitco Dixie are on the racetrack right now, and unfortunately, we have scratched down to a six-horse field. There were four scratches in this race, and that because we had two and three-quarter inches of rain, as we talked about, and the turf course is soft, so there were some horses in here that do not like a soft course. And you can see the first three horses there. Seraphan, a big one, Neil Drysdale's horse, was scratched. Sardaukar, $100,000 claim for Gulfstream's leading owner, Michael Gill, strategic partner, a talented three-year-old for Mark Henning. He's just getting back in form now at five. Del Marchaud, the four to five favorite, the star of the show now with all the scratches, second in this race last year. Perfect Soul, a lightly raced five-year-old, grade one placed. And then we have Luke Mosk for Christophe Clement. Should love this course. He's a very consistent French, but he handles a soft uh, turf course. And Dr. Brendler on the outside coming off a win. And here's a look at number seven, Del Mar Show, for trainer Bill Mott. And he has regular rider uh, Jerry Bailey in the saddle there. Getting well bet and deservedly so. Last year in this very race in the Dixie, here is Del Mar Show on the lead. He sat just off a fairly good pace that day. And the turf course was uh, much the same is what it is this year. It was a yielding course. They went 49-4 uh, for the half. And here he is grudgingly, grudgingly, has to settle for second behind Strut the stage. Very, very good effort. But Del Mar Show has been doing quite well for Bill Mott. Had a little bit of a layoff after the Breeders' Cup. And uh, now he's back in action. He's coming off a whim. Well, joining me now is Bill Schaefer. He is regional manager of the Mid-Atlantic Division of Sitco Corporation. And, of course, they have been here sponsoring our Triple Crown Week coverage. This is your third year now sponsoring? This is our third year, uh, Janine. Uh, we're pleased and proud once again to be back. Uh, the racing program here, the thoroughbred racing and being part of the Triple Crown, is it really just complements everything we do at Sitco with our total sports package programs. We do a lot with professional baseball and NFL, but you know, we're no stranger to racing either. We sponsor, we are the major sponsor of the Boston Marathon. And naturally we have a NASCAR race team with car 99. So thoroughbred racing just adds that it's a jewel for us with our sports package. When you take a look at the profile of a Sitco customer, they're a very active customer that loves competition. And particularly today, when you look at the head-to-head -head competition that we'll have out here, it just doesn't get any better than this. That's right. Now, I know you bet on this race. Who did you bet on? I bet on the horse that I lost on last year, Del Mar, <laughs> with uh, Jerry Bailey. And uh, I'm looking for a 7-8 or an 8-7 exacta here. And what about the Preakness? Uh, the Preakness, uh, definitely. I like peace rules, funny side. And I think coming down the stretch in the end, uh, hopefully we'll be kissing Saint. And I hope it's, she's coming like a runaway uh, freight train. Well, I hear That's you're quite the handicapper, so. I had the triple with the Kentucky Derby, <laughs> okay. so got a little lucky. Right. Well, we'll wish you good luck. And we always thank Sitco for their support of Thoroughbred Racing. They've been a great friend to the sport. Kenny. Thank you, Janine. He's nuts for Del Mar's show, and so are the betters. Four to five on Del Mar's show. Did quite well in the Breeders' Cup mile. It's 61 to one, got up five back you know, in the race, middle of the pack. Yeah, race. finished seventh, but still was beating only five lengths. Uh, a few more things to add about Del Mar's show, if we, if we can get back to him. Uh, he's three wins in this race for Bill Mott. Paradise Creek in 94, Yagley, Hap, and also when he finished second in this race last year, he was coming off of a trip to Dubai. 
and that tends to take a lot out of horses. This year, he's just coming off one win at Keeneland. I talked to Billy Mott, and he says that he thinks, even at age six, that Del Mar show has never been better, so that bodes well for him. Mott, Bailey, and Turf. Hammer, what are you thinking on this race? Well, watching Del Mar show, he looked like he was a laboring second last year. That may indeed be the case again this year, the way the track is. And you look at Lou Mosk and the races that he ran in France, three wins, four seconds on a very soft turf course over there. I think he'll benefit from that. That's my selection. They're coming near the gate now. Yesterday we had uh, some trouble with these animals. They wouldn't cooperate when they were trying to get in, but they've been more, they'll they've be been well behaved today. It's cold. They just want to get in and start racing. Another interesting horse in this race is the number eight horse, Perfect Soul. If you're a believer in uh, omens or maybe that uh, certain pedigrees are better on this kind of surface than others, Perfect Soul is a son of Sadler's Wells, bred in Ireland. There he is behind the starting gate. Earlier on the card, uh, the other turf race we've had, the Gallerette, was won by a horse called Carib lady I think that was over on ESPN too who was a daughter of Sadler's Wells bred in Ireland so we've already seen one Sadler's Wells success so far this horse ran in the Breeders Cup turf last year didn't run very well but a very talented horse winner of four of eight lifetime turf racing so different than dirt it's just a big charge right when they hit the turn you usually don't last on the front end unless you can absolutely get clear Dave Rodman they're behaving it's your race to call ah they're behaving finally today Luke Moss moving in there's Luke Moss and Dr. Brendler and they're in line and up right away in the Sitco Dixie Del Mar show bounding out to the front and strategic partner came out as well in the second spot and in between horses perfect soul and Lou Mosk is taking under a grasp here by Santos and uh, Lou Mosk in no hurry early on as a matter of fact it is a crawl here through the stretch for the first time Del Mar show is in front Del Mar show with Jerry Bailey, slowing the pace white right down to a walk, leading it perfect soul second. Lou Mosk is third. Strategic partner fourth on the inside in Saar to car. And last of all is Dr. Brendler, some six lengths off the lead. No challenges yet for Del Mar show, just loping right along around that turn. Perfect soul in the second spot. Lumas tracking on the outside. Strategic partner is at the rail. Relaxed in fourth and two and a half or three lengths off the lead. Sardaukar in a loose rein racing second to last and Dr. Brendler trailing the field. The perfect soul now in Prado going to try to put some pressure on Del Mar show. Continues a narrow lead. Just about four and a half furlongs out. Lumas third. Strategic partner at the rail. Followed by Sardaukar gets some encouragement and Dr. Brendler trailing the field seven lengths from the front. A half mile out in the city Dixie Del Mar show still strutting along out there from perfect soul second strategic partner and Lou Moss Dr. Brindler ranging up three wide for a bit five links in the front Dr. Brindler is trying to move up now and just three off the lead midway on the final turn and perfect soul prompted by Prado to get ahead in front from Del Mar show here comes Dr. Brindler with a sustained bit on the extreme outside any one of the three of them have a chance here Del Mar show perfect soul Dr. Brindler quickest of them all on the outside Dr. Brindler quickens on for perfect soul Del Mar show followed by Sardaukar in ball from three off the lead eighth of a mile left to go Dr. Brindler and Ramon Dominguez bringing the doctor home perfect soul is fighting hard Dr. Brindler a touch too much Dr. Brindler's won it by a neck. Perfect soul second. Del Mar show possibly third in a photo with Sardaukar and then Lou Mosk and strategic partner. All right, Rand, I'm not so sure that we mentioned Dr. Brindler. <laughs> Did we? I don't think we ever mentioned his name. We're going into this race. Dr. Brindler. What's strange about it, Randy was writing down the times and, and elbowing me about how slow this looked like we were watching a slow motion. Maybe the slowest quarter in the history of horse racing, 27 and change. Giving you the indication that Bailey would have all that all that energy saved and just sprint in the stretch. But look at this Brindler coming back from about four as they hit the top of the stretch. They went the first six furlongs in this race in one minute, 18 and three-fifths seconds. That that is just unbelievably That's slow. That's fair time. And you had the two horses that were in front. You know, you had your Del Mar show. You had your perfect soul right there. The two favorites, the two horses that most people expected to win. They were getting the benefit of the soft trip. But yet, in the middle of the racetrack, Dr. Brindler, trained by gray emotion, getting by far the biggest win in his career. He ran in this race last year, Dr. Brindler did. He finished to one. fourth in the Dixie at 34-1. to one, But he was behind Del Mar show, of course, who finished second in that race. And today, he turns it around on him. Sometimes it can be deceiving because the front end was going very slow, Ramon Dominguez, but you still were able to roll past him. Yeah, quite honestly, I had no idea. I couldn't get a sense of the pace. Uh, but Grand Motion was very confident with this horse, and he told me 
to make sure to get him back and let him relax. And uh, I did so, and uh, he worked out great. I mean, he around the turn started picking it up real nice and finished up real strong for me. They went the first six furlongs in there. You guys did in one eighteen and three. We given up on you guys in the back of the pack. It's all right. Well, quite honestly, <laughs> I couldn't tell you whether we went on one nine or one twenty because I had no idea. I, my horse was handling the soft going real well, and I was happy with the way he was moving early on. You're giving it some uh, some big motion on that whip. You're laying in there in the stretch. So if you want to get him by the eight right there, give us a little bit about Fufa's Warrior coming up in the uh, Preakness. Well, I'm very excited. I mean, it's a big race, and uh, um, I know I'm, I'm aware of how competitive the race is, and I know that my horse has high odds, but at the same time, I have high expectations for him. Uh, I was on him only once last Monday for a workout, and uh, I was very impressed with the way he went, and uh, I think that his running style might suit the, the race, and uh, he might set up for him some. Well, he had high odds on this one, 18 to 1 coming through. Good luck later in the day. Go take Thank your you pictures. Thank you so much. Thanks. An upset here, certainly an upset to us. Next time, we'll definitely list all the horses in the race <laughs> before we send them to the gate. Come right back. From Saves on embarrassment. <laughs> back here at Pimlico, and a reminder, if you want to see some auto, go very fast. Please be watching k and Filters, Super Nationals, the qualifying 6 o'clock Eastern. That's coming up very soon, ESPN2. Much faster than the running of the Sitco Dixie, grade two. Nevertheless, Dr. Brendler comes home, the upset winner. Maryland bred, owned and bred by Francis O'Toole, a five-year-old. There were two ways you could play this horse. One way was that he was one of three horses in the race that had experience racing in Europe. He wasn't an Irish bred like that other horse I was talking about, but he raced in Ireland, actually, so the courses are a lot softer over there, and so he was, he was kind of accustomed to that. And there he is rallying on the outside once again at 18-1 to 1 that we totally missed. The other angle is the trainer, Gray Emotion. He's the guy who spots his horses very judiciously, and when the course turns up off like this, uh, yielding soft was the official turf condition, he's more than often going to scratch unless he really has a good feeling that his horse is going to handle it well. So the fact that he kept Dr. Brindler in this race, I think, was a good sign as well. It looked like Jerry Bailey conserved a lot of energy up front, but instead he'll conserve it for himself for racing later today. He's with Janine. That's right, and he did ride earlier in the Gallaret on the turf, but he, you said you were on a little filly. She's very light, and the, the turf course didn't seem as soft on her. Right, well, the heavier, the, the more body weight you have on your horses, the deeper they're going to sink in this stuff, and the deeper they sink, the more trouble it is for them to get their feet back out of it, and it just wears them out. So a lighter horse gets up and down through the deep going a lot better than a heavy, muscular horse. So did it surprise you that the turf course was as soft as it was for Del Mar show? Be the pace was unbelievably slow. It was, and being on a light filly, she got a the ground earlier in the day and I thought well maybe it's not too bad but on a heavy horse I could see how soft it really was. Well sorry it didn't work out for him but let's switch gears now for the Preakness and uh, 10 cents a shine I know we talked about him yesterday and we were talking about Wayne had said that he, you know he thinks the horse is more mental stumbling blocks than than physical what's your take on him? Well I worked him before he ran in Florida and I thought a lot of him at the time actually and uh, he's been kind of disappointing since but Wayne had a talk with me yesterday and he said he thinks he's gotten him over most of that stuff. He's and, feeling good uh, this morning. <laughs> well, uh, maybe by this afternoon he'll have his, uh, his game face on better, but he thinks he'll run very well. And uh, what about his running style? Because I I in the Derby, Wayne had said that he thought he ran a very solid, very good last half a mile. Thought he was making up quite a bit of ground. What was your take on it? I thought he ran a lot better race than people expected. Uh, but I knew he could run. I didn't know what, what day he was going to put it all together. And our strategy is, is to let him be where he wants to be in the, in the course of the race, but I'm not going to ask him until after the half-mile pole and hope for one big run. All right, well, if anybody can get the run out of him, Jerry Bailey can, so good luck later. Thanks. Kenny? Thank you. They went official with this race, the 10th, the upset. Dr. Brenler. look at that. Give it